Hey everybody, my name is Delinda Miller and I am the author of the Phyllis Quest and Ragor Chronicles. There are six books in these two series and today I'll be reading chapter one and two of Winter Frost, the very first book I wrote in 2013. The book is about a family of gnomes called the Tudor family. And the hero of this book is Silith, who is on a quest for his lost brother. I hope you enjoy this book and will listen for, for many more weeks as uh, we read through the first series of Silith's Quest and maybe even time for the second series, The Ragwort Chronicles. And be sure to keep listening, because at the end of the story, there will be a prize as a free book for the first three callers. More on that will be stuck in doubt later on. For now, enjoy. Chapter 1, Silith's Garden A blue summer sky smiled upon Silith's garden. Colorful butterflies danced from flower to flower as crickets chirped and bees buzzed along herb-sealed windowsills. Rows of neatly tended plants lined the soft soil and stretched their hungry leaves towards the warm mid-morning sun. Lush plants cradled, shiny red tomatoes and yellow squash grinned from beneath curly vines. Silla puffed from his pipe as he stood between the rows of taters and onions. A beautiful morning, smiled Silla. Silla was a little gnome who lived in an old oak tree on the side of a grassy hill. He stood about two feet tall and wore purple pants with an orange patch on the right knee. His favorite red suspenders fell neatly on top of his bright blue shirt. A pointed green rimmed hat sat atop his bald head and a long flowing brown beard hung down to his belt and ended in a curly point. Streams of purple smoke rose from his pipe as he surveyed the progress of his garden. A drowned squirrel named Edward hopped along the fence that bordered his yard. Good morning, Edward. Morning, Philip, replied the squirrel as he picked a juicy tomato from one of the large green tomato plants. Your garden has really come along this summer. It looks great. Yes, indeed it has, thank you, replied the gnome. I'm very pleased with its progress. We had a bit of trouble with the squash and cucumbers early in the season. Some nasty little critters are eating them to pieces. But, thankfully, Mr. Curlyvine showed me how to get them under control with a special type of vegetable oil. I still see an occasional dug from time to time. Edward hopped down from the fence and disappeared under a few of the broad green leaves of the squash plants. Sound as you, he proclaimed when he finally topped back up. As he flicked the dugs over the fence, he noticed that Philip was deep in thought and staring out into the distant hills. Thinking about your brother again? asked Edward. Scylla blew a turtle stream of smoke from his pipe and sighed. I decided I'm going to tell Ivy tonight, he replied. Salo has been gone on his quest for almost seven years now, and I'm really starting to get worried. It's time that I go look for him. Edward hopped back up into the fence with a fresh, tiny, shiny tomato. Well, well, 
well, Philip. He said, Excuse me, but if you're seriously thinking of going after your brother, you know that I'm going to be cunning along with you. The gnome smiled. Thank you, my friend. I was hoping that you'd say that. Philip stood between the rows of taters and onions and stroked his long brown beard and puffed on his pipe as he pondered his brother's fate. At that moment, a small circular window opened from the base of the tree and Ivy's head poked out. Warm yellow light glowed from the kitchen into the garden. Are you still standing there? asked his wife with a grin. How long does it take an old gnome to pick three onions and a tater for breakfast? I bless. You've been talking up the storm for over an hour now. An hour, giggled Philip. Good grace, it's only been a few minutes. Edward and I are talking about my brother. Well, replied Ivy, unless your brother is going to kick me three onions and check the nail, it's of no concern to me. She gave a snort and closed the window. Philip rolled his eyes, picked three juicy onions and a tater from the garden, and walked along the front stone path to check the nail box. He was surprised when he saw three envelopes sticking out. Two were bills, of course. But the third was a letter from his friend, Azur, known by everyone else as the Blue Witch. The addresses on the envelope were inscribed in a slowing, majestic calligraphy. A large purple stamp with gold trim had been carefully placed in the top right corner. A letter from the Blue Witch? Maybe this was news about his brother. Philip grinned and felt his morning improve as he walked back along the path to need Ivy for breakfast. Chapter 2 Tallis and Polly Tudor Many millennia ago, the village of Twisted Oak was settled at the edge of the great granite mountains and the vast enchanted forest by a group of mushroom farmers. They grew the most lovely mushrooms. Some looked like little white pearls. The farmers called them candy shrooms. They were as sweet as sugar, and the wee ones would steal them as quickly as they popped out of the ground. Their mothers and fathers always knew when they'd eaten too much because they would come running home with tummy aches. Some of the mushrooms are golden and big enough for a family of four. They were prized. Contests were held in the farmers' native villages to see who could grow the largest mushrooms. There were mushrooms of all shapes, colors, and sizes. The mushroom farming took a lot of land, and the old villages had become overcrowded. Paulus and Polly Tudor, Philip's greats, had organized a group of farmers to search for new soil to cultivate the mushrooms and raise a family. The farmers traveled across many leagues and along many roads. They even crossed a great sea of water where they almost were swallowed by a sea monster called a nester. After years of travels, however, they finally found a land that seemed untouched. The soil was dark and rich. It fell through your hands like a silky snow. There was a huge gnarled oak tree growing on that land. It had a twisted trunk and many curled limbs. 
though it was lush with leaves and acorns. Gray, green moss grew all over the trunk and roots. The tree was so big that it provided enough shade for the mushrooms to grow. As a result, because this gnarled gray tree was so inviting and prosperous, the Tudor family settled the village of Twisted Oak. Although the soil appeared fertile and native plants seemed healthy in Twisted Oak, the mushrooms that the farmers had tried to grow turned into toadstools. Inedible, slimy, spongy toadstools. Over and over they tried, using the stores from their prized mushrooms. The mushrooms they tried to cultivate, unfortunately, just wouldn't grow. There were some mushrooms, however, that did grow. They were beautiful, but had not been started by the farmers. They grew on their own and were bright red and taller than the farmers with enormous white spots. For every toadstool that had wilted away, a giant red and white mushroom grew in its place. Then their shrooms must be edible, exclaimed the farmers, who by now had used up all of the food that they had brought with them on this long journey. That was even too frightening for her. Instead, she would tell the children about the Blue Witch, a friendly warlock, really, and how he was visible any time they peered their eyes up at the constellation Aquarius. She said that the blue stars that sparkled in the constellation far away in space were, in fact, snatched down by the blue witch and set up on top of his staff. He called them his blue witch lights and would send them floating around the castle while he performed his magic spells and stoke his enchantments. The children had always gasped during the part of the story imagining the wondrous images of the floating blue witch lights and the magic stills. She would tell the ch children how the blue witch would visit them, that even sometimes the blue witch would give them the special mission. It was rumored that when the blue witch visited you, it was time for you to leave Twisted Oak and perform a special quest. Philip loved his great-grandma Tolly's books. His and Sallow's eyes would dug wide open when great-grandma Tolly would tell them how the blue witch would eventually come to visit them. Every night before that time, the brothers would sit on a twisted tree branch outside their bedroom window and search for the sparkling lights of the constellation Aquarius. I'll bet I could snatch down those blue witch lights, Sallow had often grumbled. Some of the two relatives, including Sallow, had ventured further into the unknown regions and had never come back. Those that did return relayed fantastic tales of great green ogres, terrible orcs, clad in suits of purple and black armor, and trolls that rode on red dragons with horns and spikes. They spoke of the land, of unbelievable beauty and unbearable cold. With quiet voices, they whispered of dreadful ice castles, a castle called Winterfrost that stood in the middle of a massive field of snow. Its many pointed towers and steeples reaching and searching for the stars. They even told of dinosaurs as big as the grand twisted oak or worse creatures 
that populated the great and terrible cities that encircled the castle of Winterfrost. Some, once they had checked their surroundings for eavesdroppers or spies, even dared to whisper tales of a dragon and a red witch who could freeze a creature or gnome with a stare. Some of Tullus and Tully's children, when they were grown, went off and settled other villages. They had taken their tater and onion plants and used the red and yellow onion skins and purple potatoes to make dyes to color their clothes. They lived in many of the neighboring villages like Woodgate, East Toadshire, and Drogancell. The Sarno gnomes of Drogancell had clearly built their homes in the hollow ears and heads of great ruined stone statues that stuck out of the green grass. Some great statues were buried so deep that only the heads were visible above ground. They were the guest houses. One family made their front door from the open mouth of a bearded dwarf warrior. Other statues rose hundreds of feet into the air, their swords proudly thrust into the heavens. Some had said the stone statues had been left behind by an ancient race of dwarves eons ago, but nobody knew for sure. Here and there, only NASA's stone arms and feet stuck up from the earth. These thoughts had quickly claimed as playgrounds by the known children. At the right old age of 970, Tallis Tudor walked out of Twisted Oak and into the vast enchanted forest and never returned. Tolly had waited and waited that knew after seven years that her beloved Tallis would never return. One autumn evening, while the night air was cool and crisp, and crimson leaves drifted and crackled from the treetops, great Grandma Tolly gracefully walked up the long curved staircase to her bedroom, put on her favorite night dress, drank a cup of tea, and climbed under her favorite blanket. She never awoke. Their youngest grandson, Cedric, took over the farm with his family and raised his children in the great mushroom mm -hmm. castle. <laughs>